Howdy. We are here from Cloudflare, and we are here to discuss our story on memory encryption. I'm Derek, and I work on the infrastructure security team here at Cloudflare, and I'm based out of Austin, Texas. And I'm Brian. I'm a hardware engineer on Cloudflare's hardware team, and I'm also based out of Austin. Uh, our primary focus is on designing what our next generation server platform looks like and how we can make it highly secure without impacting performance. So before we get started, uh, there is one quick slide on who we are as a company and our global presence to help visualize what we are doing in order to understand the level of work it takes when we design our server platforms. So a little bit about who we are. Our network spans across 200 cities in more than 95 countries, including 17 cities in mainland China. We have interconnects with over 8,800 networks globally, including major ISPs, cloud services, and enterprises. We have internet properties uh, that are over 27 million and used by approximately 13% of the Fortune 1000. More than 1 billion unique IP addresses pass through Cloudflare's network every day. We operate within 100 milliseconds of 99% of the internet connected population in the developed world and over 95% of the internet connected population globally. Just for context, the blink of an eye is 300 to 400 milliseconds. We serve 14 million HTTP requests per second on average with more than 17 million HTTP requests per second at peak. We consistently do approximately 4.6 million DNS queries per second. That's around 400 billion queries per day uh, and about 11.9 trillion queries per month. We wanted to talk about these numbers because everything we do is at scale. At the same time, security is of utmost importance. So we wanted to talk a little about encryption and how we handle encryption here at Cloudflare. We do encrypt different data states. Uh, we encrypt data at rest, including our cache on disk. One of our engineers recently made a post about patching the dmcrypt Linux module because he found that while the cost of SSD and flash drives went down, the modules were still built for spinning disks. So a patch was created to remove all the extra queuing and asynchronous behavior and revert the encrypt to its original purpose. Simply encrypt, decrypt, IO requests as they pass through since we were using faster storage mechanisms than we were 10 years ago. We also encrypt data in transit. We've even collaborated with the Internet Engineering Task Force on evolving and standardizing the latest version of TLS. This, helped create, this helps to address some of the older cryptographic problems and design flaws with TLS that created the conditions for attacks like Park Lead, Poodle, and Berserk. But what about data in use? This is data that is being processed by one or more applications and data that's currently in the process of being created, updated, appended, or deleted. It also includes data that is being viewed by users accessing it through various endpoints and is the data that is susceptible to different kinds of threats depending on where it is in the system and who is able to use it. And while we use different me methods to protect data in use, we are always challenging ourselves with better protection modes. So one of our concerns is that someone could come in and steal one of our servers out of a data center or colo but it doesn't necessarily have to be a Mission Impossible style snatch and grab. How many of you have received reports of a rack or racks that were left unlocked or worse, missing a door? I joke around about these things, but they do happen. Racks can be left unprotected and sometimes controls can be bypassed. So if someone were to steal one of our servers, the question becomes, what exactly could they pull off of it? So when we just started discussing the concept of protecting data in use or further protecting data in use, we wanted to address how we could protect memory at our current and future scale. 
And the reason this is important is that data is stored in the clear. Uh, this can leave data vulnerable to snooping by unauthorized administrators or different methods of probing. Dim memory modules, when powered down, gradually lose data over time as they lose power, but do not immediately lose all data when power is lost. We've seen from a flux of research papers that memory modules can potentially retain at least some data for up to 90 minutes after power loss. Well, a reboot will generally take care of flushing memory caches, right? Well, that's what, you know, cold boot attack works to defeat. Dump the contents of pre-boot retained physical memory via firmware modifications, which an attacker can then use to inspect that data. Newer non-volatile memory technologies exacerbate this problem, problem since an NVDIM chip can be physically removed from a system with the data intact as it uses NAND flash to store a copy of its contents similar to a hard drive. Without encryption, any stored information such as sensitive data, passwords, or secret keys can be easily compromised. So do these attacks really happen? Cold boot attacks, as mentioned previously, first talked about more than a decade ago, have started making a comeback with recent research papers, introducing new methods to defeat DDR memory scrambling technologies that were used to obfuscate data written across the memory bus. By monitoring memory bus transactions, attackers are listening and looking for objects that can be secret in nature. Think passwords, TLS keys, etc. Since the data was merely obfuscated via XOR and not encrypted, these attacks themselves were not very sophisticated, leaving DRAM exposed to memory extraction techniques. And then we had Rambly, which allowed an unprivileged attacker to read out certain memory belonging to other processes by leveraging the row hammer and bit bluffing effect. Common hardware mitigations such as targeted row refresh introduced other potential attack vectors like trespass. Increasing the DRAM refresh rate leads to fewer bit flips, but there is a power and performance trade-off. And while ECC memory does complicate the attack, it does not prevent it. So we started looking into ways of better protecting memory, and we started looking at enclaves. Uh, it's memory encryption and isolation can be achieved with enclaves. It can be done in software only, but hardware manufacturers made hardware-assisted trusted execution environments to help create security boundaries by, uh, by isolating software execution at runtime so that sensitive data can be processed in a trusted environment, such as a secure area inside an existing processor or a trusted platform module. But enclaves were really meant to only process and run small pieces of code, not an entire OS. While there have been research papers that have shown how you can do it, they have come with performance trade-offs. On page class is also limited to 128 to 256 megabytes of, uh, of cache. Um, and it still is a performance trade-off by enabling that. And at the same time, application refactoring uh, is required in order not just to enable, but also to use the Enclave itself. And there have been a string of recent vulnerabilities that have come out. Things like load value injection, which are transient execution attacks that inject attacker data into a victim program and steal sensitive data and keys from an Enclave. Recently, cash out, which is a newer speculative execution attack that is capable of leaking data from caching mechanisms, including Enclaves. And SGX, which is a further evolution of cash out in the form of an uh, enclave side channel attack. So we made a series of blog posts uh, earlier in March regarding our next generation server hardware that we labeled Gen X for the 10th generation. And it's based off of the AMD Rome architecture. We spoke about thermal design power, improvements in L3 cache, and overall performance tuning but we were surprised at some of the included security features which weren't readily available from other manufacturers. In this case, it was secure memory encryption. Um, secure memory encryption is an x86 instruction set extension introduced by AMD in 2016. So it's been around for a few years for page granular memory encryption support using a single ephemeral key at boot with a new key generated by the processor in every boot. A page that is marked encrypted will automatically 
will be automatically decrypted when read from, mem from DRAM and encrypted when written to DRAM. And while there have been a handful of presentations and papers on secure encrypted virtualization, also known as SEV, it wasn't a feature we would use as we typically do not isolate with, with uh, hypervisors. The SME components are fairly straightforward. There is an AES 128-bit encryption engine that is embedded in the memory controllers and is able to transparently encrypt and decrypt data in main memory when an encryption key has been provided via the secure processor. Then you have the AMD secure processor, which is an on-die 32-bit ARM Cortex A5 CPU that provides cryptographic functionality for secure key generation and key management. You could think of this like a mini hardware security module that uses a hardware random number generator to generate the 128-bit AES keys used by the encryption engine. The AES algorithm uses a physical address as a type of knots. It is hardware isolated, so keys are never sent in the clear outside of the uh, system on a chip, and it runs its own secure OS and kernel. So how it works? It works by requiring and, and by enabling a model-specific register, which is a control register responsible for executing the x86 instruction sets. This enables the ability to set a page table entry encryption bit. Uh, here we have the documentation officially from the AMD uh, de developer's manual. Support for SME can be determined through the following CPU ID function. Bit zero indicates support for SME, and again, the relevant uh, AMD documentation. Here you can see it on a test box, the validation output. You can validate that it's turned on by viewing the message buffer output by grepping for SME. You can view the EAX register contents by using the CPU, CPU ID utility to show support for the instruction in, in the processor and validating that bit 23 in the MSR is present. So how it works for an actual write, after memory encryption is enabled, a physical address bit, also known as the C bit for encrypted bit, is utilized to mark if a memory page is protected. The operating system sets the bit of a physical address to one in the page table entry to indicate the page should be encrypted. This causes any data assigned to that memory space to automatically be encrypted when written to memory. So a page will be allocated, that page is zeroized, the encryption bit in the PTE, if it's set, clear it, or if it's been cleared, set it. Uh, then with a series of instructions is flushing the translation look aside buffer, flush memory caches, update the PTA, and then flush the TLB again. And when, when data is read, the secure processor provides the key to the AES engine to decrypt the data. The operating system sets the bit of the physical address to zero in the page table entry, in the page table entry to indicate the page should be decrypted. And this is how standard SME works. And while it would be great to mark the pages we want encrypted ad hoc, we wanted to ensure that all memory was encrypted by default. And so that's when we looked into transparent SME. And as the name suggests, all memory is encrypted and it's performed transparently in the background, invisible to the OS. All traffic going to the memory controller is encrypted, regardless of the value of the encrypt bit on any particular page. This includes instruction pages, data pages, pages corresponding to the page table itself. And no applications were required, so no need to refactor any applications uh, to ensure that the applications themselves are using encrypted memory. It's a BIOS uh, UEFI option that when enabled sets the MSR bit to active. Then your OS can activate memory encryption by default by setting the following kernel flag and by supplying uh, memencrypt uh, equals on on the kernel command line. So now that we know that it's active, we wanted to test and see if it worked. So we built and built and loaded a kernel module specifically for memory testing that allocates a page of memory, zeroes out the allocated memory, and issues a set memory decrypted function call against allocated memory. Um, this specific function call is called to remove the encryption bit associated with the buffer under test. 
this doesn't actually decrypt the contents of the memory buffer, but will just mark it as not encrypted. This can then be used to compare against the reference buffer and determine the state of secure memory encryption. Then we check if the allocated memory is still zero. Uh, if SME is enabled, memory will still be all zeros. If SME is disabled, memory will not be zeros. So here we load the specific uh, kernel module, uh, and then we get an error, and we do that intentionally. Uh, we want the load specifically to intentionally fail so that the module doesn't have to be unloaded before we're running the test while still capturing the debug output. Uh, so with a module fa failure, we can still see the contents of the memory buffer. We can view the module output to console where we can see the, print, the printout of the actual hex dump. The printout shows the beginning of the buffer before the call to set memory decrypted. Uh, and that checks buffer, buffer reference, and page size is still set to zero uh, and after where the buffers do not match. So now that we know it works, how well does it perform to our performance testing as well as rolling it out to production? And I'll hand it off to you, Brian, to go over the results. All right, thanks. Um, so, uh, yeah, as, as Derek said, now that we knew that the feature worked, our next step was to test um, how, it, how, if it, any, it would affect performance. Um, so we ran a series of benchmarks um, in the lab, um, and then um, based on the results of those, we took it to production. Um, the Gen X servers that we're running this on have eight 32 gig DIMMs running at uh, 2933 megahertz. And we're using the Epic 7642 um, processor, which has 48 cores and 96 threads. And we're running in, in nodes per socket equals four mode. Uh, we're a Debian shop. We run Debian 9 on these servers. And our kernel version is 5.4.12. So the first test we ran was the stream industry standard memory bandwidth test. Um, we used this, the standard stream.c available from the University of Virginia. Uh, but what, one change we did make was to increase the um, data set size to be around five gig, gigabytes. Um, and the reason why is that these, um, these processors have a large 256 megabyte level three cache. And we didn't want that, that big cache skewing the results. So the graph that um, you're looking at here, you can see that depending on which sub benchmark you look at, um, we saw anywhere from a 2.6% to a 4.2% performance loss from implementing SME. Um, the next test we ran was the crypt setup command. Um, this tool is normally used to encrypt disks, but in this case, it has a built-in cryptography benchmark that we can use to, uh, as a quick test of CPU and memory performance. And um, on this test, we saw less than 1% performance loss from, from activating SME. So um, this, this uh, benchmark is not particularly memory bandwidth um, constrained. And then finally, we ran a custom web traffic benchmark that was developed by our performance team. Um, this uses Cloudflare workers to generate web traffic from one host to another in the lab. And um, again, here we saw um, less than 1% performance hit when um, transferring this small uh, 10 kilobit byte image from one host to another. Uh, it uses 256 concurrent clients to do that. So uh, encouraged by these results, we went ahead and, and uh, activated SME on a host in production and then um, compared it to the performance of a host that's sitting right next to it in the rack. So they're both in the same colo, uh, just one with SME off and one with SME on. Um, this graph is a snapshot of a recent um, interval of um, web traffic to the server. Um, this is Nginx request serviced, and um, you can see the performance of the two servers track each other pretty closely. Um, 
we are averaging and over the time period that you see here around 5% fewer requests per second service by the host that has SME enabled. Thanks for that, Brian. Um, so what's next? So some of our future work uh, includes doing this at a fleet-wide rollout. Uh, we currently have this uh, enabled on in Acolo, and we are, are, are pleased with like a lot of the results. So uh, planning on rolling this out fleet-wide. Also, uh, putting the ball in Intel's court for total memory encryption. <laughs> this spec has been released, or was released, back in 2017. Um, and uh, we've recently uh, seen uh, Intel make some progress in deploying this in some of their future processors. So we'll be excited to test this as well. Uh, at the same time, more research. Uh, you know, we, we love testing CPUs, so we're looking to see if ARM has a risk equivalent, as we believe full memory encryption to be a technology that will be widely adopted. Um, also looking into some newer AMD features uh, for memory encryption uh, when it comes to secure nested paging and seeing if it can protect container runtimes. So to summarize, um, first, memory attacks will happen. They will continue to get more sophisticated even as we continue to create countermeasures for them. Full memory encryption is available. This is an added security feature that doesn't require code refactoring and is something that was surprisingly easy to turn on and test. And the overhead isn't as bad as we thought. In the majority of test results, performance decreased by a nominal amount, actually less than we expected. AMD's official white paper on SME even states that encryption and decryption of memory through the AES engine does incur a small amount of additional latency for DRAM memory access although it is dependent on the workload. Across all 11 data points, our average performance drag was only down by 0.699%. Even at scale, enabling this feature reduces the worry that any data could be exfiltrated from a stolen server. So for up-to-date info on what we're working on, please feel free to follow our blog, where we are consistently publishing content on new technologies and topics that are relevant in this day and age. And with that, we thank you. Thanks for watching. Hi, um, Derek and I are here to answer questions. We had some good ones coming in through the Q&A. Uh, Angie asks, what's the overhead of encrypting memory? Uh, ho hopefully we addressed that to your satisfaction, Angie. Um, we ran a bunch of synthetic tests and saw anywhere from 0% up to about 4.6% uh, hit on the test that we were running. And then on our live production environment, um, it's anywhere like 4 to 5% overhead, um, is, as in fewer requests per second service by Nginx uh, with SME feature turned on. Fernando asked, does the chip manufacturer have similar instructions like AMD, Intel, ARM, do you manage just on smaller devices and not desktops? Um, so yeah, we, we addressed it. Intel uh, has a spec for total memory encryption as well as multi-key total memory encryption, which is similar to AMD's F. Um, and they do have it on some smaller chipsets too. Uh, uh, actually, uh, AMD does. Um, as far as ARM, um, we're still trying to investigate. Um, I said they don't share the same x86 instruction sets that, that Intel and uh, AMD do. So, um, but we're in discussions to find out if they have like a relevant, relevant equivalent. Yeah, and there were some press releases from Intel based on their um, summit that they had, a security summit earlier this year, where they said that they are um, kind of getting the infrastructure in place for their implementation of this and um, patches to the Linux kernel and stuff like that and that the, the feature would be supported in hardware on just future chips. So they haven't really made a specific announcement about when that'll happen. But that's a good question. We got that good one from a couple on, of people. Yeah. Um, any experience on using SEV with VMs or containers you can share? Um, so not looking specifically at SEV, because SEV, um, although we've seen extensions of that for, work for containers, we are more interested in like the, um, the secure nested paging uh, feature within AMD chipsets that we're looking into as being able to, as to protect those container runtimes. 
uh, not sure if you can answer, but has CF <laughs> has Cloudflare notice servers at various co is disappearing completely or worse, suddenly going offline and later coming back online? Um, not that we can really answer it, but it's a concern of uh, of of us, and hence we wanted to protect kind of like the the some of the physical attack vectors. Um, this being one of them, that if if this were to happen, you know, how could we ensure that that um that our our hardware itself was was being protected um, as best as possible? Um, is there any reason to use uh, transparent SME instead of SME if the OS Linux supports SME? And then we wanted to just do it transparent in the background and have it be more uh, BIOS controlled. Um, so, uh, you know, we didn't want to just turn it on ad hoc. Um, and since a lot of what we do is when we deploy our hardware, we automate a lot of the configurations, we figured it was a lot easier just to, just to turn this, this flag on. Uh, and then we already answered the, the info question. Uh, the comparison between SGX and SME um, is not right here. We, you're right, it is actually a different threat model. The reason we brought that on is that it was more or less from uh, from some of the enclave side. Um, we didn't want the specific overhead of actually enabling um, enclaves because there were limitations. If we were looking at protecting all of memory, um, we didn't want to have that limited memory space. Um, uh, most SGX machines, from what we found, out, you know, just allocate a maximum of 128 megs of memory um, for the EPC, the enclave page cache, uh, and that would be shared amongst all enclaves. So we didn't arbitrarily want to choose what we wanted to run in the enclave. We just were more consistently worried about memory protection. Um, so, while not the same threat model, it was still the same concern. Um, I think that's all the questions we have. Yeah, I think we addressed um, them all. Okay. Oh, appreciate it. Oh, wait time. a second. There's a, there's a second page. Oh. Let's try and get to the, some more of these if we can. Oh, oh that's it. You see at the top where you can click would to make sense two to out of three. Yeah, yeah. Uh, would it make sense to provision per user memory encryption keys? Um, that's that's something that we have thought about. Um, uh, something that we're still looking into. Um, so yeah, that's 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 potentially a use case too. Can virtual machines choose to utilize as independent and independent of the host? <laughs> yeah, that's a feature of uh, secure encrypted virtualization. So if you are um, Again, running hypervisors, um, you'd have the the host OS run its own encryption key, and every VM have um, uh, encryption key assigned to it. Uh, SME doesn't have cryptographic integrity. Can you give some thoughts on whether your threat model includes attacks against integrity? If it does, if it doesn't include, should it? Um, yeah, that's a tough question. Um, we we we. It does, um, and I think that's something that we've kind of addressed with the vendor um, uh, specifically. Um, as I said, if, if, we're, if we're trying to do like some form of measurement, then it's either going to be a combination of some other features that we are going to enable or um, something we defer back to the vendor to. So Michael asks, you were using 32 gig the, DIMMs. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, that's okay. You were, you were using 32 gig DIMMs. Do you anticipate any additional problem with higher density memory? I, I don't think the feature is going to work significantly different with a different memory config. I, I, like, um, I don't have any measurements to, ba to base that on, just um, because it is all in hardware and um, it, it's all built into the memory controllers. I would expect it would work the same way with 64 gig DIMMs. And. Uh... So the last one I'll, I'll take is, can I attack edit the boot args to stable memory encryption? Um, no, we're, we're layering that with other um, with other features. So things like um, silicon-based hardware boot trust um, uh, and other features secure boot to uh, to prevent that. So um, uh, that's a big thing too. And, and some models that you can do um, uh, to kind of like limit that as well. Um, and that's something that we're, we're going to look at sharing in, in, a, in a future talk. Thanks, everybody, for the questions. That's a great time.
Yep. Thank you.